All right, now we're joined by Dana Bieber and Billy Wallace, who are going to explain why we should vote no on Initiative 1631. So go ahead and take up to five minutes to tell us why to vote no. Great, thank you. Um, I think I'll go ahead and get started, and then I'll turn it over to Billy. Um, as you said, my name is Dana Bieber, and I'm the coalition spokesperson for the No on 1631 campaign. So appreciate the opportunity to be here and to talk with you today about a very important ballot measure that voters will be voting on here in November. Um, but before I get started, I want to say one thing I think that both sides on this debate can agree upon, and that's the fact that climate change is a serious issue, and it deserves a serious response. The problem is 1631 is not a serious response. Instead, it is an ineffective, costly, and misleading measure. And that's what I'd like to talk to you about this evening. You know, the proponents like to say they're going after the largest polluters in the state. That's what they say, but that's not what they wrote. What they don't tell you is they actually exempted eight out of the 12 largest carbon emitters in the state. That in and of itself renders this ineffective. If you're not, if you're not going after the largest polluters, you're leaving them off, you're letting them off the hook, then who does pay the fee? It falls to small businesses and consumers. We'll pay the fee in ways that of the basic necessities that we all need. The cost of gasoline will increase, and, and the proponents have admitted it, 13 cents a gallon in the very first year alone. The cost of electricity will increase. The cost of natural gas will increase, which is the intention, of course. That's what a carbon fee is meant to do. It's meant to increase cost to consumers. The state says it'll be about $2.3 billion in the first five years alone, in addition to increased utility costs that will occur as well. So, so taxpayers and ratepayers will be paying for this in a number of different ways. What's really troubling about the measure is the complete and total lack of accountability in the measure. There's nothing in 1631 that actually requires reduction in greenhouse gases. There's goals, but there's not requirements. So we can spend billions upon billions of dollars and actually have no reduction in carbon emissions. That's bad policy. If we're going to spend, some, spend money, shouldn't we get something for it? And 1631 simply doesn't provide us that assurance. In addition, there's no spending plan. There's a 15-member board that will be responsible to, for doling out billions of dollars, and they're accountable to no one. They don't answer to anybody. They don't have. Uh, they don't. Conf they confer with the governor. They confer with legislative leaders, but they have no oversight. It lacks complete and total accountability, and that is a troubling measure when we're talking about something that's so important as climate change. I don't think we should leave it in the hands of 15 unelected people who answer to no one. That's where our coalition has come together, and we've been joined by labor unions and small businesses and consumers and Washington families who are urging a no vote. With that, I'll turn it over to, to Billy to share his thoughts. Thank you. Uh, my name is Billy Wallace. I'm the political and legislative director for the Washington and Northern Idaho District Council of Laborers. Uh, and you may ask why, why the labor is in on this. For, for my members and the building trades in general, uh, we are a transient workforce. We travel to where the work's at. And when we get there, we know that the first day we show up on the job, we are working ourselves out of a job. We're going to be going on to the next one when that, when that time comes. We may work from two days to two weeks. We may be there two months. If you're lucky, you're going to the same job for six months or a year. Uh, that doesn't happen very often. The reason I'm telling you that, and I'm one of those guys for 10 years before I went to work for the district council, I worked down here, right downtown Seattle, right off 6th. 37 miles from Lake Stevens, I live in Lake Stevens. So uh, this is, for us, it's a regressive tax for our members. Uh, it's passed on to them. There's nowhere else for us to put it. It's on our backs, it's on everyone. You take farmers, you take our members over in Eastern Washington, they drive even farther. We have two locals over there, Spokane and Tri-Cities. They have to drive even farther than we do. Uh, just to look at this, this is a statewide uh, initiative. Uh, it's gonna affect everyone. For us, we have nobody to pass it on to. So Dana did a great job starting out, and I know you guys have questions, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave it there, and I'll yield my time back to you guys. Great, thanks. So now we'll open up to follow-up questions. These are up to two minutes for each answer. We have Ben and then Liz. So it sounds like um, both of you are really concerned about the environment. And you don't believe that this initiative is the way to go. Um, what is your coalition doing for to, to take care of that? What are you proposing to do instead that would curb carbon emissions and uh, set things straight? Well, our coalition came together for one reason and one reason only, and that was to defeat this measure. Because until we defeat this, we can't get a better solution. But you know, I think that there's a couple of things we can all agree upon when we're looking at a carbon pricing solution and we want to address climate change. Number one, we can't exempt the largest polluters in the state. 
Number two, you can't push all the costs down to small businesses and working families. Number three, there's got to be accountability to the public. And number four, there's got to be a guarantee that there will be a reduction in greenhouse gases. 1631 fails on all four of those tests. Can I respond to that just real quick also? Mm -hmm. uh, the laborers and the building trades in general, we're already working towards that. We are part, uh, we're not climate deniers. We agree that there, there needs to be a fix and we're trying to push that way. We're helping build wind farms. We're helping build solar farms. We're out there already pushing for green renewable energies. We're trying to get down in Goldendale, trying to get that pump storage place, uh, storage unit built so that we can pump water up during the day for free using wind and solar and then at night let that water run back down through turbines so we feel that we're doing that we're trying to lead on this and, and like i said the laborers are not climate deniers we've been saying that for years now we need to build a bridge to the future and uh, a sustainable transitional bridge you're not going to snap your fingers and get off so i'm quick <laughs> i had the same question then did Additional questions? Oh, sure. <clears throat> Just simple. Um, I'm, could you tell me more about your coalition? And then I'm also curious because I believe that the yes on 1631 is a coalition that I believe has some of the same groups like labor and what you have is small business. Yeah. Give me a sure. What you yeah. have there, we, we do have a split in the House of Labor right there. Uh, like I said, our members are transit. We know we're moving all the time. For the public, unions that's kind of where the splits at uh, they can take public our transportation they, they can go to the same place they can set those up We're, we don't have that option uh, there's where the split comes in I, I believe it, it's hard for us we know we're gonna have to travel my members I'm a member of two, 292 out of Everett we have everything from the Snohomish King County line all the way to the Canadian border we can't turn down jobs we don't work so the I can't speak for that side of labor. I'm not sure where they're coming from on this. For us, it's accountability. My job as a laborer is to protect my members from bad legislation when I'm in Olympia. And now it's for me to protect against bad initiative for us right now. This is a bad initiative for us. No accountability. I can't go down anywhere and hold somebody's feet to the fire if something's wrong. So that's where we're at on this. Um, have a minute if you had oh, something else yeah, to the rest of our coalition so yes as billy mentioned if we have the labor unions are part of our coalition more of the uh, private sector labor unions also the farm bureau uh, organizations representing representing small businesses such as um, the national federation of independent business and those are rep representing the small businesses who are going to feel the cost impacts of this for the increased cost of their business electricity natural gas transportation costs so we're building out our coalition and it, it increases and it grows each and every day um, in fact, just recently, our coalition was joined by um, UW scientist Cliff Mass. You all probably know him. You understand that he signed a voter pamphlet statement. His life's work is about climate change. He is passionate about reaching a solution, doing something that's effective, and he's urging a no vote. Okay, Liz and then Frank. I'm just, we, we heard and voted on and endorsed and watched go through the ballot an attempt at climate change a year ago or two years ago? Two years ago. Two years. There was one four years ago? Like we the, uh, we keep going. Did you support the last one? <coughs> I'll answer for me the first. And then, um, our coalition's only been together for a couple of months, so we didn't have any position on any previous ballot measure. We're only focused on this ballot measure and what, what yeah. voters have now. And was there a coalition against the last one? Yeah, no, there was a coalition. It's well, just no, that there's have... always a coalition against, and we never do anything. We're, we're but not... I wonder, Billy, are you able to speak to the laborers and what that? For the thinking? laborers, we were supportive of some type of carbon fee, uh, as long as there's dedication, uh, you know. And I can touch on it. If you guys think we have infrastructure, transportation infrastructure issues, it's not going to get fixed if this passes. There'll be no appetite to add any more gas tax and that's where because of the 18th amendment it's where we get our transportation funding so for us uh, senator hobbs has a bill uh, and you also need to rem remember that there's been a change in the legislators and who's in charge so i think we could uh, do that there's one thing about senator hobbs bill is it does it's dedicated you can you have accountability you know where the, the spending's going 
this thing over here is a mess right now. So that's our, our opinion on that. I'd like to hear more about where the money for your coalition is coming from. I know that Western State Petroleum Association is helping to fund this. Uh, what other uh, big polluters are helping to fund this initiative? So the nice thing about Washington State, as you all well know, is that all of our campaign contributions are reported online. Um, my guess is you probably know more about that than I do, to be candid <laughs> with you, and I have a feeling you have all the, pe all the funders uh, right on there on that piece of paper. Hey, mm -hmm. shouldn't be any surprise at all that energy companies are a part of this. They have a stake in it. They've been at the table. This is, it affects them. Regardless of what you, whether you like our funders or not, it doesn't change what voters are voting on. They don't vote on who funds the yes campaign. They don't vote on who funds the no campaign. They vote on what's written. They vote on the fact that their gas, the cost of gasoline is going to increase each and every year. The cost to heat our homes will increase each and every year. That's what voters care about, how it impacts them, how it impacts their family, how it impacts their job, how it impacts the way they can get to work and take their kids to school. That's what voters really care about. I do think, though, that voters may have they, voters have an interest in doing something about climate change and recognize perhaps there may be a cost associated with it. But you know what? I think they expect to get something for that. And in 1631, there is no requirement that you reduce carbon emissions. That's bad policy. Sarah? Um, can you? Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Yes. Yeah. Sure, yeah. Just 30 sorry, seconds. Sorry. Sorry. I noticed you said, what other polluters uh, are you throwing us in on that? Because I could respond to that. Because I can guarantee you the laborers have led on trying to get to renewable green energy for a long time now. So I'm, I'm a little, I mean, you're gonna, are you going to split us off or put us all in the same bucket? Oh, I, you guys can answer the questions. <laughs> <laughs> the way you ask it, though, we you said what other polluters. So I'm just, yeah. I didn't know if you were throwing me in there too, the labor team. All right, sir. Thank you. Um, so Jeff Johnson and some other labor leaders were at the table when 16 when was formed and you've spoken to the split in labor but can you more specifically speak to um, what percentage of the labor community voted for 1631 um, in that vote and then also I mean there are definitely funds in the measure to invest in a transition to a clean energy economy as well as retraining and wage replacement benefits so if you could just speak to that well let's start you mentioned Jeff first uh, I'll put it to you like this, during the COPE convention, 1631 did not get an endorsement. And that's because the majority of labor didn't want it. So that answers that question for you. Uh, as far, what was the second part, I'm sorry again? Um, just speak to the portions of the measure that invest in transitions. Well, it says it does, economy, but there's no accountability for making sure measures. that happens. That no accountability. Okay. Uh, they can spend this money any way they see fit. <clears throat> without any input from us, without any input from anybody, it's up to 15 person panel. Again, with no accountability. Uh, I, I, where else you want me to go with that? I think one thing, may I? Yeah. One thing I think we both agree on, both sides, and that there will be significant job losses for this under 1631. They allocate originally 15, $50 million for all the job losses. It's interesting if you look down a little few lines later, um, it says we can increase that, we can spend more money if needed. What we're talking about when we say that they can spend the money any way they want, and I think it's important that we focus on what's written, not the rhetoric and what we think. Let's focus on the words. Page two says, hey, we're gonna spend 70% on this and 25% on this and 5% on this. Turn the page, go to section three, subsection three. It says we can deviate from this. It says we can spend the money any way we want. There's no spending plan in here either. So we don't know what we're getting, right? In fact, the way it's written so loosely, they can actually invest in private corporations, startup companies. They can, if they want to, they think there's a company out there that has some sort of a renewable energy, all of a sudden, this 15 member panel can become venture capitalists. What happens if it doesn't work? What happens if it's not successful? Who are they accountable to? Not us, because we don't vote for them. Not the governor, because there's no oversight. Not the legislature. They report to no one but themselves. Yeah. Um, yeah, Jason and then David. So we've been talking about a carbon fee, carbon tax, within our organization for a number of years now. And one, two of the issues that I remember, uh, the concerns with this current initiative was the regressive nature that it would have on the disadvantaged, you know, because it's hitting homeowners. 
and people who could least afford it. And the second issue that I had was with the fairness. Uh, you mentioned earlier eight of the 12 uh, top polluters were exempted from coverage of this. Do you know offhand uh, those eight uh, exemptions, who they are and why they're exempted? They're exempt for a couple, let me answer the first part mm -hmm. first, and then, um, so you talked about the regressive nature of it. What really is punishing about this tax is the fact that it goes to essentials. People have to, they have to buy, they have to pay for. We have to drive our school, drive our kids to school, we have to get to work, we have to heat our homes. There, these are basic necessities, and that is what hurts the, the fixed income and low income families. And I think Billy will speak a little bit more to that. Switching gears, you talked about the exemptions. Yes, um, eight out of the top 12 uh, polluters, by the definition that they gave in here, uh, according to the state's data. So there's a coal plant in Centralia, that's the largest polluter in the state. Uh, they're responsible for five, five million metric tons alone, they're exempt. Um, Holka paper mills are exempt. Alcoa, a sheet metal factory, is exempt. Um, there, a lot of them are exempt because they're what's called energy intensive trade exposed industries. Meaning if you really put these additional costs on them, it will be too costly for them to be competitive. So they get a special exemption, but small businesses don't get a special exemption. So, that, so it's undeniable that eight out of 12 are exempt. So when you say you're going after the largest polluters and you exempt them, that's what I mean. It's not a serious solution and it's not, more importantly, it's not effective. And everybody that's buying fuel will be paying. You know, take the farmers, Eastern Washington. What do they go and harvest their crops with? What do they bring them over to this side to ship them out with? I mean, it's, it's, it's not, there's gonna be no exemptions for anybody that's down at the bottom that has to purchase fuel. It's simple as that. Again, it goes back to it being a regressive, regressive tax. David? My question's been asked. Um, I had one, going back, you said there was no accountability over the 15-member panel and making those kind of decisions, but doesn't, just like any initiative, doesn't the legislature have to fund this in the first place? The legislature, it's a line item in the budget. That's all the legislature has to do. They specifically, they went out of their way to make sure there was no oversight. In fact, anytime they wrote in or talked about accountability, they then kind of wrote an out of accountability. So I'll draw you to the top of page 26, and they're talking about the, the board has the following powers and duties. And the top of page 26 says it will confer with the governor and legislature uh, regarding implementation. Confer, it doesn't mean they will actually have oversight. Same thing they say, it says periodically, they will brief the governor and legislative leaders. That's a lack of accountability. Another area that I think is equally troubling to that is when we're gonna talk about the fact of, you know, hey, is this effective? So and you'll see in section 12, which is on the bottom of page 31, the Department of Commerce in conjunction with some other state agencies will draft what's called an effectiveness report to see how this is doing. Sounds pretty good, right? Okay, get down to the very last sentence where they say, so the Department of Commerce writes this draft report on the effectiveness, and then they will re they draft the report for final review and adoption by the board. They grade themselves. Think about it. When the IRS comes to you and they're going to audit you, do they say, hey, let's sit down and let's do this together. And, and I'll, I'll have a draft audit for you and then you and I can, you know, you can agree if you think it's right. That, no, that's not how it works. There's no accountability. They answer only to themselves. Like I said, what if they invested in a pilot project with uh, all these billions and billions of dollars and it failed? What do we do? We, they're unelected. There's nothing we can do. So who appoints the 15 members of the, of the, the panel? The governor's responsible for appointing some of them. And they, but they certainly, and that's, that's the position. Uh, the best of our as much as much as we've read, the governor doesn't have the authority to remove them. Are they subject to Senate confirmation? They are not. Okay. Jason. So I'm stuck on your statement that this would not be effective. And help me to better understand that. So my understanding is that both BC and California have similar measures and that it has led to a reduction, at least the slowing of the growth of carbon emissions generated from you know, human activity. Is your objection that there isn't an explicit target, like Governor Brown from California saying we will have a zero carbon future? So you want it to be measurable or are you saying that these types of measures don't work? I can't speak to those other two 
programs because I'm not I'm not an expert on the policies of Canada or California, um, so I can't speak to that. Although I, I do know that California is a different type of system; it's a cap and trade, so that's different than this mechanism. Um, I also know that in, in British Columbia and Canada, they have had seen very 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 small reductions in their uh, carbon emissions. So that's just from what I read in the media. So that's my extent on that. Effectiveness is key. When you exempt eight out of the 12 biggest polluters, you've undermined it already, right? Then when you only tax a portion of the, of the pollution, remember this is only a tax on the fossil fuels portion, you've undermined it. That doesn't make it effective. I, suspect, I don't know, I, I, I'm just guessing here. I think that may be why they didn't put a requirement in here, because maybe they know they won't reach their goals. Because why else would they not have any sort of requirement in here for a reduction? And you know what they get if they don't reach their goals? More money. It continues. This tax increases each and every year in perpetuity with no cap and no requirement for success. That's bad policy. We can do better. And I have to point out, if we pass this, if this becomes law with all these exemptions, we don't get another bite at the apple. There won't be another carbon policy because this is what it is and there's no measurable goals for reduction, come on, that's bad policy. Accountability is the biggest concern for us. Uh, I mentioned earlier, our, our members work a lot of uh, transportation projects. So there's a deep concern there that there will be no appetite. There's no way you're gonna go in and, and keep infrastructure going, fix the highway two trussle that needs to be replaced. We have a bridge, if you guys have been to Vancouver lately, that thing when you're on it moves back and forth that's got to be replaced so uh, there's there's just not going to be an appetite for raising it they may need a six to eight cent transportation package it will never happen under this all right is there a last question and one of the things that you stated was that you thought the initiative was actually going to cause folks to lose jobs mm -hmm. but the pro campaign is actually saying it's going to create tens of thousands of new jobs mm -hmm. new jobs in the clean energy economy um, and it'll invest in transition to the clean energy economy. Mm -hmm. So can you speak to um, your figure that folks are actually gonna be displaced from jobs? Well, uh, yeah, you, I'll start with, because this is what they wrote in here. And like I said, on page 10, they set aside $50 million for lost jobs. So we both agree, significant job losses. It's, it's what they wrote in here, so we both agree on that. They do like to say that they're going to uh, increase jobs. But what they don't tell you, and they get that from a study that they uh, that they did, what they don't tell you is that to get the new jobs, you have to invest $6.6 .6 billion per year to generate between 36,000 and 41,000. See, they only tell you about the jobs, right? Did they tell you that the fee would have to raise $6.6 .6 billion each and every year? They don't tell you that. Remember, this raise is $2.3 billion in five years. To generate what? According to their study, investing $6.6 .6 billion per year in clean, energy, in, in clean energy projects in Washington State will generate between 36,000 and 41,000 jobs per year. $6.6 .6 billion is what's required to get those jobs. This raises $3.2 billion in five years. It's a concern for us that they write in that there has to be a minimum pool of $50 million. That tells us that they're planning on having job losses. That's what it tells me, that's what it tells my members. This could be for us a uh, death by a thousand cuts, a slow bleed. All right, we are about out of time. If you guys want to take 30 seconds for a closing statement. Sure, I'll go to the statement. Yeah. Uh, no, 30 seconds? Just 30 seconds. Okay, then it's gonna be a fast one. Uh, you tell you what, you go ahead and take my minute. All right, all right. Thank you, you guys. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, it was a thoughtful discussion and I appreciate that. Um, one of the things that I noticed that you did here is you made me back up all my claims. I appreciate that. I suggest that you do that with every side that comes in here. Because what I found during this uh, debate or during this campaign, the yes side says a lot of things, but they don't point to them in the initiative. Everything I said, I pointed to in the initiative. So please hold my feet to the fire. I'm happy to answer those questions. And I would ask you to do the same for the yes side. Thank you for your time. I really appreciate you guys digging into this. Thank you very much.